We're going to move right into our next panel, which is entitled Teaching the Environment. And again, I will just very briefly introduce, introduce our panelists, and then uh, our moderator, uh, our Vice President for Education, Andy Mink, will, will open things up for discussion uh, amongst the panelists. Uh, from left to right, Emlyn Koster, who is recently director of the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Uh, Robin Blary, who is a teacher at the Carborough High School. Bethany Wigan, who is a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. And again, our moderator, Andy Mick. So Andy, take it away. Thank you, Robert, and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. I, I would like to note as a way to frame today's uh, panel that the sun has just come out for the education panel. <laughs> so when we talk about beyond despair, there's a halo around us now, the, the violent optimism of the educators that we have, that we have on our panel. And, and actually, I do think that that's a, a nice way to, to briefly introduce what I think will be some emerging themes um, as Robert mentioned, there's a full uh, biography of each of our panelists today, and you can see more about their background. I'm going to let them tell you more about themselves and their work. But I would like to, to at least uh, note and perhaps even trigger some themes that I think will emerge, particularly based on the conversations we've had the last couple of days. Um, and it, I think it is a recall to our initial keynote opening just a few nights ago, in which the title was Building Bridges and Connecting Dots. And ultimately, I think that's what we as educators uh, often do. Uh, our work here at the uh, National Humanities Center in Education is designed to create bridges, to build bridges between the scholarly world and the world of the classroom. Um, I'm deeply grateful uh, to my colleagues. Mike Williams is uh, in our education department. Libby Taylor's in her office now working. And we're constantly trying to conceive of project-based ways so that knowledge and content and understanding and scholarship can inform teaching and classroom climate and culture. Um, so building bridges is an important part of a session like this and of a conference like this. Um, I think connecting dots, though, is something else that uh, we as educators always strive to do. I worked with an historian once who, who said that uh, academics make the simple complicated and teachers make the complicated simple. And I think oftentimes we're trying to bounce between those two things, really, to acknowledge the complications of these, these deep and important uh, topics that we've shared for the last couple of days, but also try to create some really clear um, examples and exemplars of how, how we're actually doing this work. And so the themes that I think will emerge as you hear each of the vignettes today uh, starts with um, this idea of creating an ethical imagination and a vocabulary. And if there's nothing else that humanities can do, it's helping with language. It's helping create mental models for what is possible. Um, it's creating a vocabulary that we can share as, we, as individuals and as communities tackle these, these really complex uh, topics. The second is uh, this translation of research to practice. Each one of our panelists today will offer specific vignettes and narratives of the work that they've done, some really clear case studies, uh, with I think will be an emphasis on place, will be an emphasis on location, will be an emphasis on the connection between uh, those concepts, and taking the hypothetical, taking the research that, that we all feel very comfortable in and putting it into an actionable plan is a big part of education. And then finally, and it's one that's uh, very important to me, it's this notion of individual agency, the, the role of the educator. Um, the, the, the dedication, the, the passion, um, the ability of each of these educators to make the choice to do this kind of work. And certainly for someone like Robin, who's currently a public school teacher in Chapel Hill Carborough uh, Public Schools, um, every day she shuts her door and the standards and the curriculum that she's, uh, that, that she's committed to teaching, there's also a sense of a gatekeeper to that. She's making choices every day to find moments to address these topics. So. Uh, Emlyn, Robin, and Bethany will each share uh, vignettes. They'll talk for about 15 minutes each, and then at the end we'll have time for questions and perhaps for you to share your own, uh, your own experiences in the classroom, whether that classroom is a collegiate, a secondary, or an informal classroom. So I'm going to, we're gonna start with Bethany, and uh, it'll be my job as moderator to keep us on time, and then again at the end we'll have time for the microphone to be passed. Thank you. Um, thank you, and thanks especially to the organizers of the conference. It's been a real treat um, to be here. Um, some of you know already that Andy is, in fact, my second cousin, and I would I like to say that it's um, a thrill to me to think that our mothers would be so proud of us, who are first <laughs> cousins. It's quite coincidence that he is my second stream. cousin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it really is nice to be here. Um, 
Andy um, had us meet uh, as a group uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we agreed that we would talk quite extemporaneously. I don't do that very well, but I am going to try. But I will start, actually, by reading to you a little bit. I um, have re-scripted what I wanted to say about 20 times after each paper, after each um, beautiful set of remarks that I've heard, and I will try to respond um, to what I've been hearing as much as I can. Um, I think it's only fitting that uh, I begin with a photo of students standing on a bridge. Um, and that theme of bridge beings and dot connectors, I think, is really at the heart of what I'm going to talk about. These two students, Samantha Frisky from the University of Pennsylvania and Lucy Corlett, um, are standing on a bridge over the Schuylkill River. I'm going to read to you this part. It's pretty short. And then I'll move through a series of uh, photos, which I hope uh, you'll be able to see, and, and those on the live stream will have to imagine. <laughs> the Schuylkill River is a watery place. It's home to the Schuylkill Expressway, inter Interstate 76, or what I like to call the Schuylkill Distressway, especially when I'm sitting in my car in a pond on the highway. It's home to a riverside trail, beloved by dogs and their humans, as well as bicyclists. It's home to freight rail lines, to native and invasive plants, fish and fowl. It's home to North America's oldest botanical garden, and it's home to the longest continuously operating oil refinery complex in the world. To apprehend its nature cultures requires a welter of research methods. It requires a willingness to experiment, and it requires some tolerance for improvisation. Today, and especially on rainy days like today, the river can also elicit a distinct sense of foreboding, that it's not just bearing witness to our carbon-intensive past, but that it portends a future amidst spreading ruins. This river, like so many other urban rivers, has provided a laboratory for human experiments ranging from land reclamation to energy transitions. It is a riverscape at once unique and singular, and it is a place, one of many, that has been created through enduring histories of plants, animals, mineral, capital, knowledge, ideology, and free and enslaved humans crossing oceans. Last semester, with the basin's marshy past and its increasingly soggy future in mind, my students in a class that you see Samantha and Lucy were both in, they aimed to unpack and catalog to describe these ongoing geo and hydro engineering attempts along the Schuylkill. The class was called Liquid Histories and Floating Archives, and it's one component in an ongoing public research project on rising waters in Philadelphia. And that project in Philadelphia is undertaken in dialogue with research collaboratives working on other urban waters in five, across five continents. Together, we aim to cultivate the right to research as a human right. This work has offered me and continues to offer me some hopeful glimpses into the power and potential of public scholarship in the environmental humanities. Um, and I hope it might do that for you. The class was offered across, um, I, I think, six departments. I'm sorry, the slide is, the image is cut off there. Um, it was offered in departments across all three divisions of the School of Arts and Sciences at Penn. Um, that is the natural and social sciences, as well as the humanities. The class worked together with scientists who came to class, and it worked also with artists. You see here a project of artist Mary Mattingly, her boat, Wetland. It had sunk. You see divers in the water pumping up air bladders that were then put inside the boat to raise it. The boat um, had been in the river, part of an ongoing project that I had begun in 2015, when it sunk quite expectedly, unexpectedly, in August of 2017. 
Uh, it was widely reported on the Weather Channel uh, and elsewhere that climate change had sunk a boat that was designed to be about climate change. Or as Grist said, irony is dead. I quite liked that, and it was one of the only kind of humorous things to come out of an episode that was actually incredibly difficult. We really did not obviously expect that this boat would sink. The boat had been a wading tow across the Delaware um, to Camden, and uh, it was in August. Uh, August is not a time when hurricanes tend to come to Philadelphia. That usually happens when it happens, in September. Um, but of course, there had been, uh, as we have been experiencing in Philadelphia, increasingly heavy rains. And um, we think that some debris in the, uh, in the river um, likely punctured uh, the hull of the boat. Um, and it sunk literally in, a, in the one uh, witness who saw it in about 15 seconds. Now, lest your hopes sink along with that story, let me uh, flash back uh, to 2015 when we began this project, because I think this is an example of how arts-driven inquiry uh, can really uh, lead to unexpected research trajectories. And this is certainly uh, indicated uh, in my own case. Um, we've heard. Uh, We've heard a lot about the age of the Anthropocene, and we've heard, um, I, I think, I wanted to offer to you uh, this sense of uh, perhaps uh, we might also think of it as the age of uncertainty. We're not exactly sure did climate change sink the boat or not. There are many things we don't know. How how much CO2 we will continue to admit. Um, I want you to just hold that in your that thought in your mind about the importance uh, of the age of uncertainty. Flashback to 2015 when I began uh, to partner with Mary Mattingly on that boat, I was teaching a class called Sustainability and Utopianism. It was also uh, widely cross-listed. Um, one of the utopian experiments at the heart of that class was the world making, of course, that had happened in Philadelphia, uh, my, our own city. Uh, we concentrated in that class on uh, the colonial uh, foundations of Philadelphia, of Quaker William Penn's so-called holy experiment in the woods. Um, we looked a lot at Penn's decision to cite Philadelphia where he did. You can see on the map here, um, I'll show you an inset image. You see the grid there for which Philadelphia was so famous, settled on the highest parts, uh, the, the bluffs between the two rivers of the Schuylkill and the Delaware. Downriver, you see the vast Tinicum marshlands uh, here depicted in that wavy, squiggly sign. Those marshlands were so productive that they, in fact, were used as advertisements um, to lure the English, Dutch, and German settlers who, who flocked to the colonies, lured by promises that fish would leap into their cooking pots and, boat, and birds would fall into their boats. Today, it's uncertain. It's certain that the water is coming back. It's uncertain how much and exactly where it will come back. Today, of the 6,000 historic uh, acres of the marsh, only 200 are preserved. They're tucked into the John Hines National Wildlife Refuge at Tinicum, which itself is nestled next to the Philadelphia airport. Uh, beside and along that refinery complex that I mentioned to you. This is certainly where the water will come back, whether we experience 1.5 degrees warming or four, and I've showed you the two uh, vastly different scenarios here. It was in 2015 when I began partnering with art artist Mary Mattingly that I first experienced the lower tidal Schuylkill River, that area which is increasingly flooding, uh, in slow and visceral ways. We were installing the boat at Bartram's Garden, uh, directly across from the refinery, and we motored at low speed up the five miles through a landscape which seemed to me like the moon. And it became uh, a question to me, how had this landscape become 
uh, the way that it had? What were the choices that had been made to sacrifice such a rich and productive landscape? This is a question, of course, that no one person can answer on their own. What became clear to me was that we knew very little about the landscape itself. We knew, for example, only the air quality data that the refinery itself was producing. We didn't have any pollutant load data about the water. We knew only that it was prone to the combined sewer overflows that were more and more overflowing. So together with scientists at Drexel University and at Penn and at Temple, we formed an informal research collective. This was here you see the Schuylkill River and Urban Waters Research, our archive, where we store and make available our research outcomes and collaborative projects. We also um, challenged ourselves to get off campus and out of our labs and to talk to the people who lived and fished and worked along the Schuylkill River. And I'll just, in closing, show you a few projects that we have undertaken so far. We created a digital archive, of course, but we uh, insisted on installing physical uh, uh, you know, installations from the archive in the neighborhood itself. Here you see an oral history project installed in the visitor center of the Heinz Refuge, where neighbors talk about their changing experiences from the 1950s forward living with water in Eastwick, much of which is actually below sea level. This past summer, we taught an on-water intensive research seminar in which we offered fellowships to four Community River Fellows uh, coming to us from the Independent Seaport Museum, from the John Hines National Wildlife Refuge, uh, from Bartram's Garden, and we also had a River Fellow who was an independent artist. These. Uh, Fellows were joined by Penn students and Drexel students, um, and I'll show you in just a second a one-minute clip uh, that uh, tells you more about how students experienced that on-water intensive two-week seminar. Um, some of the stories that we have collected um, with our partners in Eastwick feature in a podcast that's ongoing, uh, Data Remediations. Um, I think, uh, Brooke, in our next session, we'll talk about uh, data rescues and, and data recovery projects. Uh, this project, too, is, is part of that. In addition to the on-water summer intensive that we hosted in Philadelphia, in January, uh, we hosted the on-water intensive in Mumbai. Uh, we're working there in partnership with the Tata Institute of Social Sciences. Next month, we'll host Teaching and Learning with Rising Waters, in which um, this collab nascent collaborative network of urban waters researchers will come together in Philadelphia. We'll be joined by um, teams working in Lagos, in Indonesia, in Bristol, in uh, Colombia, as well as other parts of the United States. <laughs> My students, so you can see them. Thank you. All right. Good morning. Um, I want to thank a Andy and the National Humanities Center for inviting me to speak today and for thinking to include teachers in this conversation. Um, I know we've been talking about education kind of around the topic of education and, and the importance of it in the environmental humanities, um, so I'm glad that we can kind of hit it head on for a little while today. Um, my name is Robin Valeri. I am the public school teacher in the room. Um, I've been a teacher for 20 years, which terrifies my mother more than anybody else. Um, I teach at Carborough High School, not too far from here. I'm originally not from North Carolina. Um, I am a city kid. I grew up eight minutes from downtown Boston. I grew up at the end of the end of the T, end of the orange line, if you if you know that. Um, I started teaching north of Boston, um, and if you've ever flown into Logan Airport, you have flown over my old house, um, slowly sinking into a salt marsh up on the North Shore. Um, and through marriage and whatnot, we ended up in Chapel Hill because my husband went to graduate school there. It's a typical story, and then we stayed for lots of reasons. 
the weather being one of them. Um, and I'm very fortunate to teach where I teach in the Chapel Hill schools and at Carborough High School um, specifically. Um, I take what I do very seriously. I'm rarely serious in the class. Um, but I am the first real experience students have learning about science. I mean, they, they kind of learn bits and pieces of it, the life cycle of a plant, the types of clouds and such when they're in elementary school. Um, in middle school, they get a little, a little more in the weeds of science, but um, then they get to high school, and then we, we really hit them over the head with it. Um, and so we are, we leave them with their, with their impressions, with their feelings about science and about the environment. And um, that's, that's no joke. That's no small task. Um, not all of my students become scientists, obviously, but they all experience the environment. They affect it. They're affected by it. Um, and so that's, that's a big job for us. Um, so these are a couple of my kids. I'm kind of, like I said, I'm very privileged to teach where I teach. I teach in the Chapel Hill bubble of schools. Um, we are not really representative of the schools in North Carolina, in the South. Um, and that's good and bad. There's definitely more goods than bads. Um, I led a teacher workshop a few weeks ago in Eastern Carolina, um, in Greenville, and I, trying to pump up my street cred with the Eastern Carolina teachers, mentioned that my school has 25% free and reduced lunch, which is twice the rate as the other two Chapel Hill schools, just because of how they draw district lines. Um, and they kind of chuckled because their entire schools were free lunch and breakfast. And so um, it is a little bit of a bubble. The, these kids are from my AP biology class. Um, I've spent most of my career teaching biology specifically, um, a lot of AP biology, but I've also taught environmental science and I teach environmental science um, this year. I've taught the siblings of a lot of these kids too, one of the many benefits of teaching at a very small school. Um, and so this is kind of one end of the spectrum of our students, kind of the privileged kids who have opportunities um, and I love and adore them and we have a lot of fun. Um, and then we also have um, kids in my intro bio classes. We have the newcomer center for our district housed at our school. So we get a lot of kids fresh from somewhere else. Um, and so they bring with them a lot of fun, but a lot of challenges. Um, and so this is one, one of my students this year, Ziza. That was his first time ever using a microscope. It was awesome. He was taking everything out of my cabinets to look at it under the scope. And every time I say, there's my, you know, it's microscope day, guys, let's get them out of the cabinets, he just like elbows kids to get that one scope, because it's, it's better than the other ones, admittedly. Um, and so these are kind of, these are my kids. And how we talk about things and the words that we use are very important for them, um, very important for all of us. So the challenges. I wrote in my notes, which I never do when I talk, notes, pish posh. Um, but this is kind of the despair. When I mentioned to one of my friends um, last summer, one of my teacher friends, that I was teaching APES, AP Environmental Science this year, um, she said, oh, be careful, because it will just make you depressed. It will just make you sad when you look at when you look at the standards from the College Board of the things that we have to teach. And she was right. This is just a couple of little screenshots from um, our frameworks of what we teach in AP Environmental. And you'll see habitat destruction, hunger, disease, acid deposition, all the pollutants, global problems, soil problems, problems. Oof. And so we, we laugh a lot in AP Environmental about, you know, thus and such has happened. We have all of this waste. We have all of this runoff. We have a lot of pig poop. It's North Carolina. We have a lot of that. What do we do? 
dig a hole and bury it. Nuclear waste, dig a hole and bury it. Any other kind of waste, dig a hole and bury it. And they, they write that in their answers. And of course, there's lots of other solutions to things. But we keep coming back to this doom and gloom, and um, it's a little hopeless. And we talked about these kind of shifting baselines of what is a pristine environment. And I would argue, and this is just my impression, that students now know that they don't live in a pristine environment, right? So when they're our age, um, they won't look back to their environment when they were children and think that's what we're shooting for. I don't, I don't think that they will hold that in their mind. Um, they know now that it might be better than the 70s because I showed them some awful pictures of air pollution pre-Clean Air Act. Um, but they know now that we don't live in a pristine environment, that we are not going to be shooting for this status 20 years from now, 30 years from now. Um, there's an opportunity gap. There's certainly um, environmental deficiencies, how students interact with their environment. Um, I grew up near a city, and we had very, you know, we were very citified, but we also had the beach five minutes away, and so we could kind of get to nature then, even though it was kind of gross. Um, my students live in a suburban, rural environment, and I would say they don't really know any more about the environment or nature than a kid in a city. Um, they think that nat nature are the cows that give them the milk for ice cream at the creamery 10 minutes out of town. I'm talking about. Um, and so there, there are lots of gaps for us to address. And then there's just this kind of hopelessness that kids have, um, that we all have, about will recycling that plastic bottle really make a difference? Will composting my apple core, because we do have a composting program in our district, will composting my apple core from lunch really matter? Um, and so that's something that we we come up against and we have to address. These are kids from my apes class. Early in the year, we were doing an um, activity on tragedy of the commons. What if everybody has access to everything? And so they were um, sucking up goldfish with a straw. And there was only so many fish in the bowl. And uh, it disappeared real quick. And so what do we do in the classroom? So I'm a teacher. I'm very pragmatic, very practical. Don't talk about theories very much, um, but we use case studies. Um, and this is to say that I'm not the only one that does these things, any of these strategies. I'm certainly not the one that does them the best. They're far better teachers than me. Um, but these are just some of the strategies and, and classroom things that we can use um, to talk about our kids or talk about the environment with our kids. Um, and case studies is one of those things. Case studies. Um, make scientific content accessible. I use case studies in um, biology and in apes, and some of them are real, real case studies, and some of them are fictionalized. But regardless, um, it gives them a, a way to have that conversation, have that conversation about science, have that conversation about um, the environment. Um, I use lots of books. My AP biology class reads the entirety of The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. It gives us a nice historical context for scientific research, not really environmentally, you know, I know for this crowd. But um, we also read slices of other popular science books. The Serengeti Rules is a good one um, for talking about the environment by, uh, by Sean Carroll. And, and we do science, right? Science is hard. A lot of these contents, um, a lot of the things that we deal with require struggle, require problem solving, require being wrong, and then sorting it all out. Um, and it's imperative that we give students that opportunity in a safe place. My classroom is very safe for them. They can mess up, and I'm not going to destroy their soul. They can mess up, and they can redo it. Um, and that is, that is science, right? It's dynamic. It's we know what we know right now, but we're going to know more later. And we're going to have to change our thinking. Um, and so we do that 
kind of safely um, with support, with scaffolds as they need it in our, in, um, in our class. And so that helps to build our community. Um, scientific community, classroom community, all of these things are important so kids feel supported and safe and that's when they're going to learn is when they feel supported and safe. Um, safe to share ideas, kind of safe intellectually as well as you know their personal security. Um, and so we have a service learning requirement for our, our apes kids called Step Ups. And so we have a, a chicken coop and a garden and other things, and there's a farmer's market in our community that students earn hours at. Um, and in this way, they kind of get these small victories of contributing to environmentalism. Um, you know, the, with all of the doom and gloom in class, you helped at the farmer's market. You saw how much compost our school brings in, and you helped contribute to that. Um, and it gives them a sense of what they do as an individual does matter even if it's just making you know, a tiny little step forward. Um, board meetings, we have, we have whiteboards, get it? Board meetings. And again, it's just another venue for conversation. Um, conversation with their peers to get feedback, um, to share what they know, and then to refine what they know from there. Um, I just like to show off pictures of my students, too. <laughs> um, and so with that, there's despair in our curriculum. There's this kind of this doom and gloom of what all of the adults have done to screw up the environment. Um, but the hope, though, are, are these guys. The hope is they understand how these systems work, perhaps how these system, biological systems have been screwed up. Um, but then give them the tools, give them the confidence to go out and try to remediate those when they leave me. Thank you. Uh, good morning, and uh, it's a pleasure to participate. Uh, as a geologist, as a museologist, and I increasingly think as a humanist, I want to position my contribution to what has, I think, become one of the major accents of this Beyond Despair dialogue, the um, term intergenerational amnesia, which has been put to us several times, but we can add to that in terms of societal hurdles, denial and ignorance, and what the California uh, uh, Long Now Foundation calls uh, society's pathologically short attention span, we have our problems cut out for us. And so um, perhaps as a geologist, I take a long look and start uh, in this 70-year uh, recap. Um, 70 years is a geological instant. It's only three generations, and, uh, and it's instructive to look over this period. Um, my choice of five dates here start with 1948, when the British astronomer uh, Fred Hoyle said that once a photo of the Earth is taken from the outside, new ideas as important as any in history will be let loose. Now, that was very prescient, um, and of course it was correct that only 21 years later, uh, what it was made earlier by John Glenn's four orbits of the Earth in the early 60s, but Apollo's mission, which has been brilliantly recalled by the current film Apollo 11, uh, highly recommended if you haven't seen it, uh, coming up for 50 years ago on July the 20th was a catalytic moment um, preceded by the birth of the Union for Concerned Scientists in March of 1969. Uh, but the Apollo mission gave us these uh, photos of the Earth from the outside and launched an environmental awareness like no other. And uh, Earth Day started uh, on the first day of spring the next year, and we're coming up to the 50th anniversary of Earth Day in 2020. And the EPA was formed in 1970, and there were many other environmental and pollution-related causes. We can leap forward um, through the 70s, and I just wanted to hold up, as a geologist, I hold on to this publication. Could you believe that the geological profession issued this publication in 1978 with the title, Nature to be Commanded, on the front cover, which is actually a quote from Francis Bacon, 
in 1620, the British scientist, nature to be commanded. Uh, how embarrassing. Uh, in 1987, we have the Sweden's Brundtland Commission bringing us the term sustainable development, which if we, I think if we're honest, we would say was a nice try, but really the, the notion of sustainability, that of conserving resources uh, fairly for future generations so was already kind of dead on arrival. We cannot bring back species which have gone extinct. We cannot re-cool the atmosphere. We can't take uh, nuclear waste out of the uh, surface layers of the earth uh, and so on. So um, I think that while this was an important term and gave rise to the focus on sustainability, et cetera, it was um, sort of uh, nice, but uh, nice try. 1990 I put on here because I think that was the birth of the citizen science movement, both with Rick Bonney at uh, Cornell in upstate New York, but also uh, a lesser known publication uh, published by the Royal Society of Canada called The Earth, um, uh, Earth Under Stress and a paper by a Toronto physicist, Ursula Franklin, who uh, said that the task of the future is to uh, link scientists and citizens so that both can hopefully solve the problems we face. Again, rather idealistic, but an important contribution. And Raleigh just hosted the third Citizen Science Conference uh, under the auspices of the Museum of Natural Sciences last month. And 2002, um, we can leap forward uh, as the year in which uh, Paul Crutzen, the Nobel chemist, said at a meeting, um, actually the year before, at the Earth, uh, at the Biosphere Geosphere uh, International uh, Commission, leading to his one-page paper in Nature in 2002 called uh, The uh, Geology of Mankind. He coined or formalized the term Anthropocene, the epoch of, of human influence. So um, just with that sort of backdrop of dates, let me continue and go to uh, almost one of the quotes by Lynn Margulis, who, um, a prominent uh, evolutionary biologist, and who was involved with James Lovelock in the 70s in publishing about the Gaia hypothesis, uh, the Gaia, the uh, Greek god of, of the planet of Earth. She sort of uh, put a finger on the right pulse, I think, when she drew attention to the fact that we really cannot separate uh, local global and that uh, nor can we separate the levels of the outer layers of the Earth system, that it all constitutes, as she says, a series of interacting ecosystems that compose a single giant, huge ecosystem that encompasses the Earth's surface. And we're talking about the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, the biosphere, and the lithosphere. And I just want to uh, touch on, on another body of research that you don't have to see any of the details here other than to see all these graphs are uh, shaped the same. This is the work of the same International Geosphere Biosphere Program. And uh, the, on the left-hand side are uh, human sort of related socioeconomic trends, and on the right-hand side are Earth system trends. And they all have the same time bar, and they all go uh, sort of exponentially steep around 1950 um, when uh, we have sort of the accumulative exponential rise of influences and irreversible trends, uh, one thinks. So if you just Google uh, the Great Acceleration, you will get this body of work. But if we go into each of the layers briefly, uh, certainly the shell of the Earth's uh, system that dominates public attention is the hydrosphere, uh, excuse me, the atmosphere, the, the climate. Um, and, and it's not surprising given our preoccupation with the weather but uh, it's, it's actually getting more, in my geological view, than its rightful fair share, because it's uh, causing us to uh, not be aware of, of the consequential uh, results and of the concurrent um, severe situations affecting uh, the other shells of the Earth, which I'll come on to in just a moment. I think having gone through you know, climate warming and climate change, I think my view is that the more appropriate term is that we're disrupting the stability of what was the Earth system, um, and we're seeing that in, in, this, uh, in the changing of the seasons and the latitudinal and altitudinal shifts in, in where we find things living and, and all sorts of other things and the points that are on this slide, uh, including, including something which is sort of out of sight, out of mind really for us in the mid to low latitudes, which is the uh, astonishingly quick diminishing winter extent of Arctic sea ice 
which is now causing a warming because of the dark, not the white, uh, surface color of the Arctic in the northern summer. Uh, but if we go into uh, the, the hydrosphere, um, we're changing um, the hydrologic cycle, which of course you probably know is that uh, summary term for the way the Earth's finite amount of water is distributed between its different modes. Um, pictures the other day of uh, people rushing for their lives in Iceland when a big chunk of ice fell across a lake and sent a big surging wave across to the other side, the point was made in the coverage that cruise ships face this all the time, and they don't realize it, nor, should, nor do we realize it when we go happily cruising up to the Alaska coastline and get perilously close to a, to a glacier front that a whole chunk of that could carve off and send a pretty significant wave in the direction of the cruise ship. But uh, the biggest consequence, I think, of, of uh, a disrupted climate, of warming climate, is the inching up of sea level and the recent series on so-called sinking cities, which was somewhat misnamed because although there is sinking going on, there is land lowering due to subsidence. By far the major factor, in my view, is the rising, the net rising of the world's ocean level due to more of the hydrologic cycle balance being shifted from ice above sea level, both in glaciers, all of which are retreating, and the polar ice caps into uh, water in liquid form back into the ocean. This is going to be, and I'll cover this briefly uh, at the end. So um, we have other trends too, and part of the hydrosphere is the presence of groundwater, which when it comes to that part of high latitudes that we call the cryosphere, tundra, that is also undergoing dramatic shifts and, and releasing carbon uh, and so on. Um, but I'll come to the, the biosphere, which perhaps is the uh, sometimes gets the news, but is generally um, ignored. And let's look into the eye of an African elephant for, for what? Oh, I'm sorry, it didn't change. Thanks. Look into the eye of an elephant. Uh, the astonishing statistic that, that an African elephant is gunned down to death for the sole purpose of taking its ivory every 15 minutes. Every 15 minutes, an African elephant is killed. So the, the population has diminished sharply and uh, we know that these are sentient animals. They grieve their young. It's a cause of celebration when uh, wildlife biologists see uh, parents with a, a baby elephant, uh, as opposed to the baby elephant having to be taken to an elephant orphanage. This is just maybe the more dramatic example, but our, the human uh, destruction of habitat in ecosystems, its, uh, it's so-called sixth extinction, where we are sort of demolishing um, the, the natural life of the planet, um, and, and we're also doing this trafficking. I think these are alarm signs for the situation that we face. Um, next, the, the lithosphere, which uh, we take for granted. We've, we're now, we passed peak soil. That is, uh, we've paved over 50% of the soil, which takes millennia and, and much more to form by penetrating the Earth's surface and uh, disposing things out of view and now destabilizing the crust due to fracking and so on. But these natural spheres of the, of the planet, uh, the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, the biosphere, the lithosphere, are now being added to by, by really entirely human constructs in the, in the Anthropocene. That is, um, that the population of the planet in 1948 when uh, when I first started this brief chronology, was two and a half million today. Two and a half billion. Two and a half billion today. It's approaching seven billion. That's in 70 years. We've gone up almost five billion humans, and we've also completely altered uh, the surface environment in what is increasingly called the technosphere. So, um, to move to the end of this, uh, as a museum uh, professional. Uh, I was certainly moved uh, at a conference that was held with National Science Foundation funding in 2012 at the Smithsonian, which was about the future of natural history museum settings. And in the declaration, which I had a hand in writing with Eric, with, uh, with the president, uh, the director of the National Museum of Natural History, uh, phrases we used were, we are at a critical moment in the continuity of time, and we have the urgent responsibility to give voice to the Earth's immense story and to secure its sustainable future. I, I, today, if I was still in that room writing this, I would not have put the word sustainable in. It's past sustainable. We, that's a sort of a, a nice idea, and it, we can sustain 
locally in household levels, and arguably only countries like Costa Rica that we heard about yesterday, and maybe Iceland, and a few small others are feasibly acting in a sustainable fashion. The rest of the countries in the world, are uh, this is past tense stuff. Um, the Anthropocene, therefore, looms as a major construct for how we think about the, the situation we now face. Uh, it hasn't even been formalized yet by my profession, the geological, they still keep on fretting on when we'll define the base of the Anthropocene. It appears to be increasingly around the early 50s, uh, which is an isochronous moment uh, when nuclear testing happened in the southwest uh, deserts of this country, and we can recognize uh, the residue of that atomic testing in sediments and ocean cores around the world. Uh, that's not saying that human influence wasn't dramatic already. But this quote by uh, the chairman, Jan Zlasevich, who's the chairman of the uh, Anthropocene Working Group for the International Union of Geological Sciences at the University of Leicester, that the Anthropocene represents a new phase in both humankind and of the Earth, where natural forces and human forces become intertwined, so that the future of one determines the fate of the other. I also find very succinctly accurate the recent report in uh, Lancet, the medical journal, of its joint study with the Rockefeller Foundation, published a few years ago, then when it said that planetary health, planetary health, is the health of human civilization and the state of the natural systems on which it depends. Lastly, um, you know, this back to the sea level rise, I'm not suggesting that it's going to be in any human lifetime that we see the entirety of the, either ice cap going, uh, but if all of Antarctica melts, sea level goes up 200 feet, and if all of Greenland melts, sea level goes up 20 feet, we only need we only need the predictions for the end of the 20th century, the 21st century, of probably three to five feet to do uh, uh, major damage on a very high percentage of the Earth's seven billion, by then eight, nine billion inhabitants who live within a few feet of sea level. And so that's catastrophic. And I'll end you with uh, a reminder that the Earth's only agenda, the Earth's only agenda for even beginning to pinpoint some of these issues is that of the United Nations with its so-called sustainable development goals. I'll say that those are misnamed because there's no such thing, I think, as sustainable development on a global basis. But this all started uh, back in 2015 with a focus on, on the goals that are at the top half of the slide uh, that interestingly were the left-hand slide of the Great Acceleration one earlier, all of humans' uh, frailties here. And then they realized before they published this uh, that they ought to add all the environmental signatures, and there it continued on to 16, and then in goal 17 said that all of us have to work together in unprecedented partnerships. So I, my point in making this contribution is uh, that we need to uh, synergize holistically across uh, uh, all of the human and scientific disciplines and, and, and to realize that nothing can be separated from anything else, which uh, maybe is a comment of despair but I think if we started to realize that it's all intertwined and, uh, and, and that we must see things in a holistic manner, maybe that would be progress. Thank you very much. We will now take questions and comments. Uh, Jackie Kellish will be walking around with a microphone. Um, we can acknowledge you and please share your thoughts, your feedback. Be hmm. <clears throat> and then I want to thank you for your statement. Uh, I have painted, as I have said, in the Arctic and Antarctic and taking images to people of the upper latitudes and showing the beauty of uh, what ha of, of, if, of what could be lost but what could affect our future is really important. People don't have to go to these places, they don't have to go to the Amazon, they don't have to go to these places, but increasing the awareness of these areas alone and getting back to your question about just seeing white rather than seeing places that could impact us, that's really very, very important and uh, that has to be amplified. Um, 
I had a show recently in Frank Gallery of my polar work. I could have put other work in, but it's just very important to constantly show these areas and how important they are to all of us, the upper latitude areas and how they're impacting us. Because if they go, we go. And that's my message. If the, if the penguins go, and people make jokes about penguins, if they go, we go. Thank you. I'd actually like to ask one question, particularly of Robin and Bethany. Um, and I suspect that there are some students from Chapel Carborough who go to Penn, so in some ways you're talking about the same students here. But I'm wondering, um, from both of your experiences in the classrooms and in these project-based work that you've described, what is it that you have to unteach in order to engage your students? In other words, what, what kinds of things, what kinds of misconceptions or uh, misassumptions do they have that you have to unteach in order to get to the learning that you described? talk, which was um, that um, this misconception about what nature and the environment means, what it looks like. Um, and it's actually really for that reason that um, we have put um, really ugly landscapes at the heart of what we do in this, in this effort to, to really um, get people to understand that uh, environments are not just Arctic wild the wilderness, they're also that, um, but that um, you, you, communities of care um, must exist in places beyond national parks. Um, I would say, I mean, there's a ton of misconceptions that kids come with. I mean, hole in the ozone and greenhouse effects, they get those mixed up. I, I don't know why. Um, and some folks mentioned yesterday this this idea of characteristic megafauna, um, saving the whales, saving the elephants. Um, but systems exist at many levels, um, macro all the way down to the micro, and trying to explain or get across their importance to the ecosystems, to students, is that's definitely a challenge in a um, a misconception that a lot of them have is that they overlook many parts of, of food webs, essentially. So that question, I think, gets to, to content. How about just their agency in this process? How do you feel students at either of your levels, secondary and collegiate level, see them as having a, a vibrant, active role in addressing these problems? I teach teenagers, and so they have plenty of apathy about everything, about homework, about the environment. Um, and I, like I said, um, giving them those kind of small victories, right? Seeing the effects of composting or recycling at a very small level and encouraging them to kind of go beyond that um, is good. And that's where you can get some positive peer pressure, where some kids are like, I'm going to go work at the farmer's market. Why don't you come along? And just getting them, encouraging them to do that um, is helpful. Um, I'd like to speak to that, if I might, um, which is that I think that students at the collegiate level um, are experiencing a mixture of great agency and a feeling of uh, total uh, lack of power um, at the same time. And I'll illustrate this in the, in the following ways, which is in the class that I spoke about, um, in my more prepared remarks, many of those students are very active in um, the fossil free movement, um, which is a, a movement uh, across campuses to um, insist on the importance of universities taking leadership to divest their considerable endowments from uh, carbon intensive industries. The students um, feel tremendous agency in that they, in our classrooms, are able to have those cerebral discussions. They're able to create original work and research. And then they go to the board meeting of the trustees and they are not heard and they are treated often in their opinions with disrespect. Um, and they are finding that 
they are up against a cognitive dissonance that on the one hand that they are being asked to think about the experimental and collaborative knowledge communities that our age of uncertainty and climate disruption requires and yet when they speak truth to power they are actively not listened to Can i just um, suggest on that point if you haven't seen uh, the video online of Diane Feinstein receiving a group of students in her office where she's dismissive of the students. Uh, it's worth looking at in order to see how grave that situation is. But I think one of the most refreshing new phrases we're hearing in the news is, where are the adults in the room? The, the, the Western world demonstrations by school students on Fridays going out of school to demonstrate against climate change, school shooting or whatever it may be, I think is maybe one of the most refreshing forces at play, and I wish it well. Um, this is just to pick up really on what you were just saying, but have that partnership with the scientific community. So this, this phrase, citizen scientist, um, from 1990, was that the year, Emlyn, that you talked about? We're, in addition to having young people want to be empowered and have their future at the table and have their voices at the table, I think we have seen recently that there are more scientists that want to have their voices at the table. After the Women's March, there was a scientist march. Um, and we're seeing people in the community come together, the third citizen scientist event, and so, I'd like each of you to say something about how you think those bridges can be built. So if it's a bunch of scientists having a march over here, but then a bunch of kids filing a lawsuit over here, how, what can we do to bring them together? Because that seems to me to be something very powerful. I'll just put my museum hat back on. I've been a museum CEO of Nature and Science Museums for 32 years, and I. I'm speaking in New Orleans at the annual meeting of the American Alliance of Museums in a month on, on the Anthropocene as our conscience to the museum field. I think that the museum field's traditional fixation on the past, if you can't collect it, you can't talk about it, is going to sort of send us into a sort of a suicidal future because museums are, are more visited in the US than professional sports are, are watched live. And museums need to step up and shift their time frame from just being comfortable in the past to the present and the future. And as you know, uh, Deborah, we held uh, uh, sustainable development goal town halls. And right in front of you is Katie Arman, who, who worked with me in getting uh, Greg Fischel to chair, to, uh, to, to facilitate town halls on many of these sustainable development goals. And, and it was one of the most powerful things we did, and it led to us shifting the mission statement of the museum, other things included, to be what it now is, which is that the mission of the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences is to illuminate the natural world and inspire its conservation. That's a completely unique and different type of mission statement than we exist to collect, preserve, and interpret, fill in the blank, which, as many people have said, we'll no longer do. It doesn't say about what, about what are you trying to relate to. So. I think museums have to step up to the plate, and that's thankfully a bit of a rising tide movement. Um, I'd like to also address that briefly, which is um, to say, you know, um, when I started first collaborating with scientists, that was the first time that I you know, spoke with an NSF program officer who kept saying, like, well, it seems to me you should go after an informal STEM grant. Um, and that was the first time I really understood what the informal STEM sector was. But what became increasingly clear to me is that um, for all of the salutary effects of citizen science, um, there is a very limited understanding, I think, still to this day with, with most uh, scientists about uh, what, um, what the humanities do. <laughs> Um, and that we also make stuff and do stuff and that we create knowledge in the world. Um, and that science communication is actually quite boring, right? But storytelling is can be, some stories are garbage, like we heard yesterday from Stephanie Foote, but other stories are actually deeply creative and help us to pose 
to understand the world in new ways and pose questions about it, see it otherwise, to do that work of apprehension that we've heard many people talk about here over the last couple of days. Um, and I would say that we really need to think not only about science museums and infor the informal STEM sector, but actually really robustly insist on the importance of STEAM and public humanities projects in partnership with citizen science projects. I think we need citizen humanists. I would just, uh, just say that I think it was a very positive development, I think, last year that the the world's two major societies, one on the social sciences, one on the sciences, decided to uh, converge into one uh, collective society. They did this at a major meeting, major meeting in Taiwan, which speaks to the vision of Taiwan that was mentioned earlier. So we're, we're making a number of positive steps, of which uh, that would be one, I think, to echo what you just said, Bethany. Um, I'll add on to that. In order to, to build bridges, I, I work with teenagers, so let's hit up social media. Um, I think that's a really good platform for them to meet and interact with scientists and, and science-y non-scientists. Um, I was peeking at Bethany's phone earlier, and she was on Twitter. I was on Twitter. Um, and she follows the scientists that I follow. Well, that's a wonderful way to build a community. Informal, not super personal, but if we're dealing with teenagers, they're used to that. They have tons of friends, followers, et cetera. Um, but it gets them exposed to the science or to the environmental humanities. Um, there's hashtags like actual living scientist. And they can go out there and they connect, can connect with folks doing research. And there's some really cool stuff. And there's some really cool things happening on social media. There's March Memo Madness, if any of you are, are huge dorks like I am, which was this whole, like, showdown between mammals that happened on Twitter over the past few weeks. And it's a great way to engage kids and then to get them following scientists um, and science-related folks um, to kind of start piquing that interest. And, and a lot of scientists are really open to kids reaching out to them with questions. Um, and equally to teachers reaching out to them, like, I saw you tweeted about this cool study. I just keep hitting a paywall to get your paper and they'll send you a PDF. Like, we don't have access to a lot of those things on our high school systems, um, and a lot of scientists are really open to sharing their work, and I think that's a, a really useful platform, at least for my, my crowd. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> First of all, my gratitude and admiration for what uh, you all are doing that's so precious for, as a strategy to go beyond despair, really. And so, Bethany, uh, thank you very much for, your, uh, for what you say about the Skakil uh, project. And uh, uh, so the, the, at the beginning of your, of your talk, you described uh, uh, in a very uh, poetic way uh, uh, the life on the, on the river and the biodiversity and the interactions and the way uh, the, the citizens and the, the human and non-human citizens actually enjoy the place. And at the end of this... Uh, waterway, of course, you put the petrochem oh, the, 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 the refinery. Perhaps you say that U.S. oldest refinery. Uh, and Philadelphia is an historic city, so it's so precious with uh, and uh, and uh, uh, full with uh, with culture, with memory. Uh, of course, in my in my memory, in my imagination, this resonates very well with another place, uh, which is Venice, because Venice is not only. Uh, a very uh, uh, so a, a world heritage site, uh, uh, such a unique city, but it's also a, a unique ecosystem, a lagoon in which you have one of Europe's uh, most uh, perhaps uh, polluting uh, petrochemical factories. And uh, at the end of your uh, uh, of your uh, of your um, talk, you also mentioned this uh, this uh, uh, seminar um, uh, teaching. Uh, teaching and learning with rising water. Of course, Venice, again, in my imagination, with these uh, tides and the, the, actually the, uh, the risk, the danger, uh, threatening uh, more and more every day that uh, the, the rising level of water might finally overcome also, also the site. So I was um, wondering whether in the seminar you also address or you invited uh, 
uh, or considered um, this kind of issues. So not only places that are far away, uh, exotic places or only places uh, uh, um, in America, but also places in Europe. Because sometimes, uh, and that was also actually the, uh, uh, the sense of what I was uh, um, saying to, um, uh, asking to Kira in the previous uh, uh, session, sometimes uh, when, you, when one talks about non-Western or Western perspectives, uh, one tends to focus on, um, when one talks about Western, one tends to focus on Anglo-American situations. So sometimes uh, Europe, is perhaps out of the of the picture, Central Europe, Mediterranean Europe. So, uh, I was wondering whether, in this case of rising water and teaching and 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 learning with water, also places like Venice are encompassed. Um, the short answer is no. Venice is not, uh, but not by. You, you, if if we had known uh, research collaboratives working in Venice. Uh, we would have uh, invited them. Um, and we really intend this to be as, uh, as open. Uh, this is just a first meeting of just trying to think about how might we create this network, right? We have some money um, at Penn, uh, but we don't have infinitely uh, you know, deep pockets. Um, we do have uh, several researchers who uh, work on uh, European rivers who will be joining us, uh, one including a, my PhD student, uh, Luna Sarti, who works on the Arno. Um, and then uh, we'll have a group coming from Bristol who works on the Severn. Um, but uh, you know, there's also uh, uh, people coming from the Lagos Lagoon, uh, people coming from Indonesia, people coming from Mumbai. Uh, so it, it's really not, uh, and uh, South America as well from Colombia, uh, two researchers. Um, so it's uh, meant to put um, American uh, watersheds, actually, uh, and research collaboratives there in dialogue uh, across continents, really. I realize we're short on time, so I'll keep this brief, but this is a follow-up question to Andy and perhaps also to a comment that you said, Bethany, which is, what do you have to unteach administrators in order to do what you do? By administrators, do you mean administrators at public school level, at university level, all the above? Um, for, so I think for me, the answer would be, um, and, and to some degree, I think maybe that's what we've done for the last several days, is to give ourselves permission to address these things, uh, permission in, in any educational system that is, um, that is really bound by the currency of time and, and efficiency and trying to meet particular standards, whatever they may be. Of course, I'm saying this in very generic terms because oftentimes, particularly at the, at the pre-collegiate level, ed, education is local. So you know, this is different in different places in the country, but it's a, it's a permission to be those curriculum gatekeepers that I mentioned, that is to make choices because it's really important that we do it, despite what uh, the, the tyranny of the day or the schedule of the standards might be. It's giving that permission and that agency to teachers like Bethany and Robin and, and Emlyn who, who can then enact uh, the, the work itself. That is such a great question. <laughs> I just want to say, um, and I'd, I'd love to hear you know other people's answers to that, including yours. Um, in my own experience about what we need to do to to also educate administrators, of whom I'm one now, right, um, is to actually say we we need to be not afraid um, to to face the politics of this head on, right. This is a political issue, meaning this is a social issue. Um, by that, I mean climate change is a social issue and environmental humanities and, and this feeling of despair that we, we are talking about here is a social issue. So I think oftentimes um, people are afraid to talk about politics because we don't have a civil discourse. Like it's be but we can reinvent that by having respectful conversations that are evidence-driven, like I just think you know whether that evidence is historical, whether that evidence is uh, big data, but it but we need to model to our administrators that those types of discussions about these social issues can happen. I was um, asked to 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 do a kind of uh, road trip. Uh, 
to speak to Penn alumni about these Rising Waters projects we have. And I think that the success of that, um, that those talks really reassured administrators to a, to a great degree. Um, so much so that they, um, that our dean um, invited me, I was incredibly honored, but also heartened to be asked to uh, give a version of this talk that you just heard to the assembled deans of all of the Ivies plus MIT, Chicago, and Stanford. And that seemed to me to be really signaling a willingness on the parts of these elite institutions to start really getting serious about what it is we're doing. Um, questions of divestment are much more on the table now. Questions of urgent action, questions of modeling experimental communities. I think we have an opening, and I feel like we are obliged to use it. We're going to have to stop now um, on that very assertive and positive note. So, um, legit. Before we thank our panelists, I would want to just tell you the logistics because we have another panel or another discussion coming up immediately. So if everyone would pick up their lunches in the back and come back and sit down, we will proceed to our next panel. But thank you all for a very stimulating um, and progressive panel. Thank you very much. Thank you.